Let's go. All right. Well, again, welcome, 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 everyone. Um, I'm Eric Majors, Executive Director of Seaside Sustainability here in uh, Gloucester, Mass. And um, Seaside is a non-profit charitable organization. Our mission is to uh, preserve and protect the world's oceans, seas, wetlands, and estuaries by motivating citizens to evaluate the critical issues facing the water environment, educating the public on best practices for sustainability and providing guidance for taking effective action. Sorry, it's a little bit of reading here. Among our most important areas of focus are the elimination of consumer plastics. We do a lot of that. And the creation of educational programs for students of all ages all over the country. By partnering with diverse stakeholders, including educational institutions, environmental groups, and other organizations across the public and private sectors all over the world, Seaside Sustainability is committed to public, uh, sorry, to building an informed citizenry to address sustainability of water-based ecosystems and communities around the world. So our tagline is really easy to remember, educate, inspire, and empower. And tonight's gonna be great. Uh, we're doing this because of the, do of the documentary, The Story of Plastic. It's truly an eye-opening um, movie in regards to the impacts of plastics, waste, and plastic production on a global scale. And I hope uh, you've all had a chance to see it. Um, plastic pollution is a threat to ecosystems, wildlife, public health, and the growing threat of climate change. As the threat of plastic pollution grows exponentially, we have to expand our knowledge on the issue. So in order to learn more about plastic pollution, we've invited four experts on the subject here tonight. Uh, in addition to our four panelists, I'm joined this evening by Ashley DeRosier, one of Seaside's uh, Board of Action members uh, and Director of Communications. Also, um, we have Board Member and Marketing Director John Russo and Intern Dory Rathmel here to make sure the event runs perfectly um, smoothly. So uh, we have a few housekeeping items to, to go over. So I'm going to hand it over to Ashley for a couple of details. Uh, Ashley, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eric, and good evening, everyone. So one of the most important parts of tonight is giving you the opportunity to ask questions of Eric and our four panelists. So the first part of the event will be dialogue among the panelists, and then we'll turn to your questions. So as we collect your questions, please enter them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're on Zoom and don't see that right away, go down to the little box at the bottom that says more. There's a couple little dots there. Q&A is one of the options in there. So just as the event goes on, type in your questions and to help us get through as many as we can. I'll be compiling them throughout the panel discussion. Then Eric will facilitate the Q&A in the second part of the evening. Second thing I'd like to cover is social media. So we'd love for you to join the conversation online using the hashtags you see on the screen, story of plastic and break free from plastic. And of course, Seaside Sustainability post about what you've learned tonight. And when you do, we'd love if you would tag Seaside Sustainability on the platforms you see here, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and LinkedIn as well. <laughs> Our username is CSUS Inc. And all of this again is on the slide right in front of you. We'll be showing it again at the end if you forget. And with that, I will turn it back to Eric to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Ashley, John, and Dory. Really appreciate it. So uh, we have here this evening, uh, Erica Chirino, uh, Sharon Kashida, uh, Lauren Packard and Dr. Judith Weiss, and uh, I'm going to introduce them, uh, each of them individually, and then ask them, uh, ask them a question. So we're going to start with Erica. Erica Torino is a writer, artist, and wildlife rehabilitator, exploring the intersection between the natural environment and human impacts. Her work has been published in Scientific American, Vice, Ars Technica, and other popular scientific publications. Welcome, Erica. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, most definitely. And Erica is uh, somewhere where it's very early in the morning for her, <laughs> very late at night. So uh, where are you, Erica? I'm now in Copenhagen, Denmark. Great. Yeah. Well, and, she's, and she's here with her puppy too, so. Yes. Um, Erica, to start with a foundational question with you tonight. Um, what is plastic and why do we use it? So um, as you've seen in the story of plastic, um, plastic is actually derived from petrochemicals. So. These are blends of man-made um, chemicals um, taken from fossil fuels, um, mostly from the byproducts of crude and natural gas processing. So we're talking about naphtha uh, with crude and ethane from natural gas. So those are processed further um, in uh, 
huge industrial facilities that just stretch um, over acres and acres um, and they are turned into plastic. Um, so they're often made into things called nurdles or um, pellets and those can thereon be um, melted down or transformed into the items we use every day from you know, uh, plastic based um, clothing um, fibers to you know, the plastic water bottles that we see everywhere. Um, so plastic has, you know, there are hundreds of different combinations of these um, hydrocarbon chemicals that are pulled from fossil fuels, but um, they can create so many different types of plastic with different types of characteristics. Um, so that's kind of what plastic is. So we, we can look at, um, you know, gas that we put in our cars and we can think of plastic <laughs> because it's uh, coming from the same source, um, you know, further down the line or um, further up the line. So anyway, that's plastic. <laughs> Great, Erica, thank you, appreciate it. Um, so uh, let's bring it over to Sharon Kashida. Uh, Sharon mm -hmm. has over 25 years in the solid waste and recycling field, uh, most of them with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, Sharon is currently our Municipal Assistance Coordinator for the Northeast District uh, 2, uh, serving 39 communities. I say our because we're in Gloucester, Mass here, and Sharon is our DEP rep. So welcome, Sharon. It's great to be here, Eric. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Most definitely. So Sharon, a question to you, important question. So what's the state, I'm always, I'm always uh, beating the drum about recycling, but uh, what's the state of recycling in the U.S. today? And tell me, is my recycling getting trashed for all of ours? Well, I really need to look into your recycling bin to tell you exactly see if you're recycling correctly or if, what as they become known as wish cycling. Um, but it's not your fault. I guess I want to assure you that. So for several decades, the United States and actually all developed countries have relied on Chinese markets to um, recycle our mixed paper and our mixed plastics. So up until January 1 of 2018, prior to that, you were probably putting all kinds of things in your recycling bin and it was picked up. And so you came home from work or if you worked at home, you went out and you picked it up. It was empty, right? So you assumed that everything in it was recycled. Well, back in 2013, we started to hear some uh, murmurs from China that the, the level of contamination you know, was uh, not acceptable. And that grumbling it was called the green fence. And there was grumbling for several years and uh, effective um, January 1st, 2018, they enacted the, the latest policy, which has become known as national sword. I'm sure if any of you have read any of the press, you've heard this expression. And effective January 1st, they, um, they reduce the threshold for contamination to less than a percent. A half a percent contamination was tolerated from um, countries that were shipping them all their waste plastics and not all, their, not all the waste plastics, but um, our lower quality plastics, let me be clear about that, and our mixed paper. Um, and so we were scrambling because nobody wanted to ship anything over there and risk having it be returned. But so how did all this come about? So we had markets before, I'll be trying to be quick. Recycling started, it was glass, it was paper, and it was metal. You know, these were single material items that were made back into those items. And uh, plastics was a whole new thing. And we have all this product coming over from China in containers and they were going back empty. So it became really easy to ship the not so valuable plastics, the not so valuable mixed paper back to China because they were very forgiving. And in fact, might've even been paying for that plastic. So wow. I guess the, the answer to is your recycling being trash? No, not if you're recycling was specific to plastic, plastics, one, two, and five. And I want you to think about this, repeat this several times during the evening. Bottles, jars, jugs, and tubs are Bottles, getting recycled. jars, jugs, and tubs. And you can leave the lids on. Bottles, jars, jugs, and tubs. Hey, uh, one, one follow-up question, Sharon. Uh, when you say contamination, 
as being a, a teacher forever and um, having contaminated food waste, I, that's where I go is having food residue as a contamination. Are you talking about that? Or are you talking also about non-recyclable plastics or items in there? I am definitely talking about uh, food waste. Um, and I'm talking about non-recyclable plastics. So, I, you know, I've you know, been amazed by the number of people that have come up and said, I didn't know you could recycle a plastic bag and you're recycling. And um, we've obviously done a really poor job of getting that point across because it's never been acceptable in our recycling. But other people say, gee, I'm, I can't recycle my toothpaste uh, tube anymore. I'm like, what? I, you put that in there? Yeah, well, it was gone at the end of the day. So she just naturally assumed it was recycled. Um, but, you know, f talk about food waste. It's, you put food waste into your recycling bin, um, it's going to contaminate everything in that bin. Think about your paper. You know, if you get food waste on it, you've just degraded that paper value. Thank you, Sharon. We'll, we'll talk more about it because I want to know about like how clean we need to make things too. So that's great. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome, Lauren Packard. How are you, Lauren? Good. Thank you for having me. Um, thanks for having me all the way here from San Francisco. Welcome. I'm glad you're here, uh, Lauren. So Lauren is a staff attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity, awesome company, uh, where she works on keeping oil and gas in the ground uh, and hastening the uh, just transition to sustainable energy in California around the country. And Lauren's going to tell us tonight all about, uh, well, if you don't, don't know, most, uh, well, plastic comes from fuel. So uh, Lauren's going to tell us all about that. So Lauren, uh, quickly, um, question to you. Tell us, what are the climate impacts of, of, of plastic production? So as Erica described, plastic is created through a very intensive process from hydrocarbons. And generally, in the US, those hydrocarbons are byproducts of fracked natural gas. So every stage of the process, and you know, to call it a life cycle is a misnomer because plastic never dies. Um, but at every stage from fracking for the feedstock to transporting it miles and miles over pipes that have seams, leaks, fiss fissures, um, to the processing in these gigantic petrochemical complexes that involves heating the feedstock up very, very high and then cooling it down rapidly takes an enormous amount of energy that is also derived from fossil fuels. So the Center for International Environmental Law put out a study and they found that from the point of extraction to the point that the resins are made, um, there's a 1.89 multiplier for greenhouse gas emissions of plastic resins produced. There's 1.89 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And then also problematic is ultimate uh, fate of the plastic. So only 90% of plastics ever commercially made have been recycled. So the plastics that are disposed of are either in a landfill, which involve, uh, results in methane emissions, or incinerated, which results in a lot of emissions, or they're degrading in the ocean, which also results in emissions. And Lauren, a follow-up question, um, this is because I think it's a, some people are kind of confused about what a ton means. Can you explain what a ton uh, of material looks like in the atmosphere? What does that actually mean? Oh, um, yeah, it's kind of an abstract concept. I think maybe a way to, Put it in more physical terms is like for instance there's a plastic facility proposed in Louisiana that will emit 13 million tons of greenhouse gases every year which is the equivalent of 3.6 coal-fired power plants and so it's estimated that by 2050 the emissions from plastics production is going to be the same as 615 coal-fired power plants Wow. So that's a, an indirect response, but that's what I've got. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, last to, to be introduced uh, tonight is uh, Dr. Judith Weiss, 
Hi, Dr. Judith Weiss. How are you, Dr. Weiss? Good to be here. You too. Very, uh, very nice to have you here. Um, so uh, Dr. Weiss is a professor emerita, emerita of uh, biological sciences at, at Rutgers University in New York. I'm sorry, in New York, I apologize. Uh, her research focuses on um, ecology and exotoxicology, and she has published over 200, uh, sorry, 200 scientific papers. Um, she is interested in stresses in estuaries and their effects on organisms, populations, and communities. Uh, Dr. Weiss, um, what happens to plastics once they get into the ocean, and how do they uh, affect marine life? Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. I have a slide. So let me get up the slide. Um, here we go. Great. Uh, when the plastic gets in the ocean, some of it floats, a lot of it floats, but it doesn't all float. Some sinks to the bottom. It's sunk down into the deepest part of the oceans. Uh, most of the effects that we know about are from organisms living closer to the surface where we can see them. And there's basically two types of effects. One is organisms getting tangled up or entangling, which are shown on the photos on the left side of the screen. On the top, you see a turtle that's gotten entangled in a net uh, and then a uh, porpoise with a plastic bag wrapped around it. We have a, a turtle, a sea turtle that's gotten, uh, when it was littler, it got tangled in a, in a six pack and it could not, its shell couldn't grow. So you've got this really deformed shell of this tortoise. Mm -hmm. And then here on the bottom left is a whale that is entangled in fishing gear, which is a, common problem up your way in Gloucester, uh, where the lobster fishery traps uh, a, a lot of, um, well, it's not trapping the whales, it's, it's, the whales are getting entangled in the ropes of the lobster pots. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but it's not, certainly not only there, it's, it's happening in many other places as well. And they, they, they swim around dragging huge weights and eventually uh, many of them will die because they are, are just weighted down so much and they lose energy and so forth. The second way that marine life is impaired or killed by plastic waste is that they eat it. There's many, many whales have washed up dead beached whales and they either find as you can see in this picture, can, I, can you see the pointer? Um, they're full of plastic. They ate tons of plastic. Uh, they have, uh, there was a pretty famous case of a whale uh, that had, they did an autopsy of necropsy on this whale and they found its gut was full of giant sized plastic bags. So it couldn't eat food and it starved to death. Uh, we have on, uh, over on the right, upper right, a, a turtle with a plastic bag. Sea turtles like to eat jellyfish and their vision isn't the best. And a floating plastic bag, clear uh, plastic bag, could fool them into thinking it was a jellyfish and they uh, eat jellyfish and so they eat plastic bags. And then on the bottom are two pictures, kind of tragic pictures of baby birds who were fed plastic by their parents. Uh, little plastic pieces are, seem to be uh, mistaken for food again. So these, these chicks, these I think are albatross chicks, uh, were fed lots of plastic pieces and could not get nutrition obviously from the plastic and, and did not have room to, to be fed real food. And, and, and so they died. So these are just a few gory photographs uh, representing the kinds of problems we see in, these are the, you know, the biggest obvious problems uh, for marine animals and plastic. We, there are a lot more subtle problems, but there's enough sort of gross 
horrible problems uh, that we don't even have to talk about the subtle problems. Yeah, troubling. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Dr. Dr. Weiss, I have a follow-up question to that. So um, you, there's two types of um, plastics really kind of getting out there into our uh, into uh, into the water. Uh, it comes from commercial and and um, and consumer plastics. Uh, do you have a sense of the ratio between, you know, uh, the difference between what's coming from the commercial side of things, uh, fishing industry, the, and what, what's coming in from consumer, all of our products? Well, certainly the fishery uh, problems are, are major and worldwide, but, but so are the consumer problems. Um, I don't know what the actual ratio between that is, but uh, I guess I can't really tell you. I, I, I would guess fishery stuff is certainly less than half, but, but I, a significant amount. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, definitely from our, um, just from, from us doing cleanups locally, uh, regionally. Um, lots of fishing, fishing gear. So th thank you, Les. Thank you so much. So, um, so now in this next section, folks, uh, appreciate a uh, welcome to our panelists. Uh, we are going to be get, uh, giving some questions for our panelists. I do invite you that if uh, all of our panelists, if you have a, uh, if you would like to engage into a, a question that you, um, that you have an interest in, feel free to jump in. Uh, we would, um, that would be just wonderful. So great conversation. I'm going to go back to Erica. Hi, Erica. Hi. Hey, uh, so tell us, when did scientists realize that our, um, our love for plastic uh, back in the, what was that? What was the movie, The Graduate? Uh, yeah. <laughs> when did scientists realize uh, that plastic was a problem? So actually, uh, scientists knew plastic was a problem quite a long time ago, even though in the past five years, there's been more uh, research published than the last 50 years on plastic. So believe it or not, uh, we've really rapidly increased our pace of output of scientific papers on plastic, but that doesn't mean we didn't know it was a problem. Um, so actually I was just one day in my spare time uh, researching papers because I, that's what I live for was plastic. Um, so I found um, a really early case uh, in the 1970s um, of plastic being identified as plastic particles. Um, so we will get into this later about microplastic and what that is. Um, but in just short terms, it's uh, the, you know, the issue that plastic um, never ever decomposes fully. It'll just break up into smaller pieces of plastic and we call many of those pieces in a certain size range microplastic. So that's the short version. Um, but I found these papers referring to plastic particles. So then I started uh, looking at them and I realized that the research methods are pretty much identical to the way that we study plastic on the surface of water today. The net is maybe a, a little bit different. Um, now we use a mantatrol. Um, generally to study plastic on the surface of the water. But we're looking at, you know, 1972, there was a paper written on the phenomenon of uh, consumer packaging washing up on shorelines. And um, the author, Gerald Scott uh, from the University of Aston, he uh, described this as um, a real issue of ecological concern and that we really needed to uh, boost the acceleration of the process of decomposition of plastic somehow uh, to prevent further ecological harm. And that same year, a uh, scientist named Edward J. Carpenter, um, he used to work at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Now he's at San Francisco, San Francisco State University. Um, and he identified that plastic existed on the surface of the Sargasso Sea, and also that um, in other parts of the world, such as off, um, you know, southern New England, so we're talking about our home waters. I'm from Long Island myself, so uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a local. And uh, he found that there were PCBs, which are these toxic industrial chemicals um, often used in, for example, boat paint um, and other products. And that was coating these plastic particles. And that is actually a phenomenon that we identify today as kind of an emerging issue. And yet, you know, this is 1972 and a scientist is already describing this. Um, I've written a paper, uh, sorry, a, a news story on this for The Revelator. So that's the Center for Biological Diversity publication. Um, and you can find that online, so I kind of go into more detail, but you'll see even in 1973, scientists said um, there was plastic in the bodies of seabirds, and now today we know more than 90% of the world's seabirds have eaten plastic at some point during their life. So if we listened then, 
where would we be today? That was my big question in the story. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, read on to see my uh, investigation, what that yielded, but, you know, it's just kind of insane and uh, an interesting thread, an important thread I, I want to note um, because we do talk a lot about uh, corporations and specifically the oil and gas industry is playing kind of a complicit role in this expansion of plastic across, especially in the US, but also all over the world is that a lot of scientists research was not publicized in the media and it was also uh, not even done or not even um, put into peer review because companies that had the huge sway over university and research institution budgets actually threatened the scientists saying, if you publish this, we're going to cut off your funding. You're going to be, you know, eliminated from our institution. Follow, um, follow the money and you'll, and yeah. you'll find the issue. <laughs> so it, it's yeah. kind of uh, insane. Thanks, but yeah, basically we knew that it was a problem when we created yeah. it. Okay. I heard recently that we're eating, um, sorry, Laura, one sec. I heard uh, recently we're eating, uh, we consume about a, a credit cards worth of plastic every every month. So uh, if that's if that's actually true, that's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, horrible. Sorry, Lauren, and you were you were uh, jumping in. I just wanted to follow up on Erica's point that the fossil fuel industry is complicit. So here we see the fossil fuel industry driving the production of plastic because of an oversupply of cheap fracked gas. There's China just instituted a ban on single-use plastics. Europe is following suit. The demand is going down even during the time of COVID when demand for PPE is rising, we see demand for plastics decreasing. But the fossil fuel industry is seeing the writing on the wall about decarbonizing transportation and energy sector. This is their bet to stay solvent in the future is to make plastics. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren, appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Weiss, um, there's so much attention given to ma uh, macroplastics, i.e. plastic bottles, common host ha household items, but microplastics, and this is going back a little bit what uh, Erica and Lauren talked about, um, uh, microplastics are a huge consequence of these items uh, that, got, that get far too little attention. So can you explain what are microplastics and where do they come from? I'm going to do a screen share again. One more slide here. This will change the slide. Here we go. Um, okay, well, back to the other one. Just click on it, it'll get you the um, I've been working, I've been, ah, here we go. Okay, microplastics are defined as pieces of plastic less than five millimeters in size. They are not um, a, a single thing. There are many different chemicals. I mean, it's polyethylene, polypropylene, all the various types of plastics. It is also very different sizes and shapes. If you go from you know, five millimeters all the way down to you know, a few microns. So there's a huge difference in shape and size and chemistry and color. So they're not really a type of, pro of pollution problem. They're a, a class of pollutants. Now, where do they come from? They come from many sources and some are the result of breaking up of larger pieces like bottles and, and, and styrofoam and so forth, breaking up into smaller and smaller pieces. Others are, uh, start off initially small. Uh, there's a picture here, um, and, and uh, getting one step further ahead, we've got lots of little, uh, littler animals that are eating the littler pieces of plastic. So we have here in the middle um, uh, a, 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 a baby fish, and you see all these little spheres here. These are, these are micro beads in its digestive system. <clears throat> this fish ate all of that stuff, all those tiny beads. Those tiny beads may very well have come from uh, uh, facial care, uh, personal care products like scrubs, facial scrubs and so forth that were in there to provide abrasion. And, and this is one kind of plastic that has been outlawed in the US, a special law 
in 2015 that was passed outlawing this. Um, but um, nevertheless, there are still some of these around in out in the world. But you can see that this baby fish ate it and it's sitting there. Now, these may in fact just pass through the digestive system and, and get excreted at the end but they may also clog up the digestive system and prevent the animal from eating real food, the same as the larger pieces of plastic do to larger animals. Uh, there's also here a baby turtle with some larger um, fragments of uh, plastic. Baby turtles eat a lot of these plastics. Um, and this, this up here, the, the top left, it, it's, an, it's a planktonic animal that was fed uh, fluorescent uh, microplastics so they can see them clearly in the inside. This is a, a small crustacean uh, plankton. Um, so the eating this stuff may affect the animals. They may pass through without causing effect, but uh, if you have certain kinds of animals and certain kinds of plastics and enough of them, uh, they will have damaging effects, altering their behavior. And it's seen in, also, it's interesting that, that some species seem to prefer eating plastic over eating regular food. Uh, and, and some of them are attracted to the plastic by the odor. And then there's uh, all the mollusks that are filter feeders like oysters and clams and mussels that are filter feeding and taking in whatever's in the water. And, and they, are, they have the possibility of accumulating large amounts of microplastics as well. Um, most of the commercial species, not just of mollusks like oysters, but of fish uh, that we eat have been found to have uh, microplastics in them. And there's also microplastics in drinking water, both the, uh, tap water and in uh, bottled water. And it turns out that bottled water have more microplastics in them than tap water, which is a good reason not to get bottled water if there wasn't enough reason. Another reason. Thank, Another you. Reason. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and so we're gonna actually go right over to Erica. So building on what Dr. Weiss just said, uh, and Dr. Weiss, if you you don't, um, if you want to stop sharing, you can. If, uh, yeah, um, I'll stop sharing. Uh, building on that, um, uh, Erica, um, continuing on what Dr. Weiss was saying, how does plastic affect uh, the uh, bodies of living beings, both human and non-human, in our in our ecosystem? Right. So, as Dr. Weiss said, um, you know there are these physical effects on wildlife um, and also possibly people, but that hasn't been studied very well yet. Um, that plastic can easily uh, entangle or entrap an animal or it can uh, kind of clog up or damage its digestive system. Um, but another kind of largely invisible effect uh, that's less apparent than maybe um, a sea turtle with a straw up its nose or um, a tree choking with plastic or a whale full of plastic um, is the possible chemical effects which um, are beginning to be um, more studied and kind of uh, better understood. So right now we know that microplastic is capable of both absorbing and leaching toxic chemicals um, from its environment. So it can actually pick up these things such as heavy metals, PCBs, which are extremely abundant um, in the environment because unfortunately humans have not only created plastic, we've created a plethora of other petrochemical um, <laughs> substances like pesticides and uh, different industrial chemicals that just are not good for us. Um, they often cause reproductive issues, um, health issues. Uh, some things um, are known as hormone or endocrine disruptors. Um, so these are going to affect, again, reproduction, um, but also could affect the rate of cancers in our bodies and the way that our bodies work. So there are a lot of you know, autoimmune diseases springing up today um, and other issues like that. So we just wonder, is plastic kind of playing a role? Um, and uh, as also as Dr. Weiss noted too, I mean, it seems that animals of all size ranges from a small plankton to a huge whale uh, are capable of eating uh, microplastic just because it's so small. Um, there are scientists I've uh, worked with on Long Island uh, with Presley, which is um, a whale conservation organization. And we've been talking about how 
filter feeding whales can consume maybe um, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of particles per gulp just because they open their mouths and they are straining through this um, seawater which is containing microplastic. We don't really know yet how uh, these toxic chemicals are affecting our bodies over time. We know that in very, very high doses in a lab, they're capable of killing small organisms such as uh, larval fish and uh, zooplankton, which are these really important little ocean animals uh, that kind of float around the surface. Um, so we're not only talking about the chemicals that we've introduced into the environment, but the inherent chemicals that are in plastic, which we call plasticizers. So again, these chemical mixtures give plastic its properties. So if you want a plastic bag, you want it to be lightweight. If you want a bottle, you need it to be hard enough to kind of carry around. So, you know, we have all these different types of chemicals and uh, believe it or not, we all have these plastic chemicals in our bodies. Um, so I think that's proof enough that we've been uh, exposed to them somehow and they're building up in our bodies. Uh, one marker chemical uh, that is definitely indicative of plastic is it's called phthalate. Um, so there are several types of phthalates, but um, these chemicals um, are only found in, as plasticizers. So we know that they come from plastic. So it's kind of incredible as a journalist uh, to be talking to scientists who say, yeah, we don't know the effects. It's like, well, our bodies all have phthalates in them and we know phthalates interrupt how our hormones work. So uh, why don't we investigate this further? But unfortunately, uh, science is not that simple. And there are a lot of ways that phthalates could get into our bodies that might not be because it's attached to the plastic. Perhaps the plastic is leaching it into our water or you know, some, some other crazy mechanism. But basically all you need to know is that plastic is everywhere. We're breathing it in. Uh, there was a study we did here in Denmark uh, where 11 particles of plastic per hour were inhaled in a, a dummy or a mannequin in a typical Danish apartment, which I must admit they are quite uh, sparely decorated, but Scandinavian style. <laughs> so there's not much you know, furniture that's synthetic, but uh, you're still inhaling 11 pieces of plastic per hour. So that's, that's kind of insane. Um, so that's kind of uh, the next piece of this uh, plastic issue with the research. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Thanks for yeah. us. Dr. Dr. Weiss. Yeah, I, I just mentioned that most of these microplastics in the air and, and in the water too are microfibers that come off our clothes. Uh, when, if we wear synthetic clothing, is a major source of these microfibers from washing machines and dryers. Washing machines are sending them out into the water. The washing machines are sending them out into the air. And, and you know, we think about bottles and bags and stuff, but think about your clothing as a major source of microplastics. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Dr. Weiss, I actually just got a uh, Filtrol 160, and apparently it's supposed to be this revolutionary uh, filter that you put onto your washing machine. So fingers crossed, I'll report out. Um, so next question is over to Sharon. Sharon, you already shared some of the issues related to our uh, recycling infrastructure. And we have two follow-up questions. Uh, the first, um, and I'll just ask them both, and if you can maybe combine them. Can you rate our common household purchases from most recyclable to least? And the second part of that is, if we know recycling isn't happening the way it should, um, and it's being incinerated for energy, it's ending up in landfills instead, does the general public need to know this? And if so, how, they should, how should they be made aware of it? Okay, so um, I'm gonna go back to the, to the first question and it's, um, it's uh, I guess it depends on how you wanna measure this. So we can look at, um, I think Erica was, the one that mentioned that um, you know plastic degrades and maybe you can recycle it uh, one or maybe two times and it's it's really what people call um, downcycled so it's not going to be recycled into what it was unlike uh, glass and aluminum they can be recycled um, infinitely into another glass jar into another aluminum can and um, you know, so that's one thing to consider. I think you could look at the at the market price of each of these things. And, you know, the highest market is for aluminum. But aluminum only, it represents one less than 1% of our recycling stream. So let's look at cardboard. Cardboard, um, at least uh, in the New England market, uh, sold for $115 a ton in May. It's, it's down from the pre-national sword days, but it is up almost um, 
$32 in a month. Not surprisingly, right? Because of the pandemic and all the online purchasing and cardboard box deliveries that are taking place. That again, 20% of the stream, that's significant. Mixed paper is 40% of the stream. It's selling at $11. It's been mostly um, in the negatives uh, for the last two years. So that's kind of a bright spot. And Sharon, I'm sorry, so you just, um, $32 and $11 to me, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but you're talking $32 times some exponential number. Can you, what's, what's that, what is that number? So just so we, just so we get it a, a sense. Um, yeah, so what, what's, a, what's a good number? Uh, I don't know, an average community might generate um, 5,000 tons of recyclables. I'm not an average, that would be a large community, 5,000 tons of recyclables. Um, and their, their pricing, because undoubtedly they are, they are paying right now, uh, unless they're one of the lucky few, um, it's all going to go in a single stream. So for most everybody, it's single stream where we have the recycling is all put into one container. It's mixed. It needs to go to a sorting uh, facility, which is called a MRF. Uh, it's the acronym for a material recovery facility. And then they need to go through that. So back to your point about food contamination. So unless it's source separated, like it was back in the day when I was a lot younger than I am now, you know, everything was in its own compartment. So it was less likely to get contaminated. But now we have everything going into one hopper in a truck. That means glass is getting broken. Those glass fines are getting into paper. If there happens to be food in that plastic um, yogurt tub that's gonna get and contaminate the paper, these all degrade the value of what's, what's in your recycling bin, right? So, um, you know, a plastic actually, uh, plastic jugs, milk jugs, the HDPE natural, they sell, for, it sells for about $800 a ton. But it's, you know, because uh, plastic weighs so little, it's wow. not, it's not so significant. And I think almost I was thinking after I watched this movie, anybody watching this movie hopefully is not going to, is going to think twice about buying anything in plastic packaging if they can avoid it. And that's, that's a very big if. So um, is that is that is that a major takeaway for you, Sharon, or that we should be uh, instilling in our own purchasing habits when we go to the grocery store? Is absolutely at all, all at all. Yeah. All. Well, I think that's to your question, right? What what has the greatest? Uh, you know, we we talk about end markets. Um, you know, what's recyclable? It's what's recyclable is something that has an end market. Um, regrettably, in the case of plastic, it's just way too cheap for them to produce new and not recycle. And we, we talked about the degradation. Um, you know, glass, unfortunately, it, it's, and all of this is also driven by your local market. So glass, which represents 20% of our recycling stream, at the same time that the National Sword um, went into effect, we had a glass bottler um, manufacturing plant shut down in Massachusetts. So um, we are, uh, you know, I am hopeful, ever hopeful that that market is going to return. Uh, it's improving and all these markets are improving as new domestic capacity comes online. And surprisingly enough, there's been a significant investment in American paper mills by uh, the Chinese. So so when you're asking, is this important for people to know, I'm going to see if I can do what um, Judith did and shared my screen. And so in Massachusetts, um, the Department of Environmental Protection uh, developed this terrific um, education campaign uh, called Recycle Smart Massachusetts. Um, the, the web address is RecycleSmartMA.org. I encourage anybody listening that it lives in Massachusetts to check it out. And for those that don't live in Massachusetts, I am sure that your community or perhaps your vendor has got something similar. Um, so the page you're looking at now, we're looking at what's called the Recyclopedia. It's this terrific search tool 
where somebody is confused or not sure if something can be recycled, they can plug it in there and they'll get an answer that will tell them whether or not they can put it out with their recycling. So it's, it's a terrific resource. There's all kinds of other, um, we have uh, open source graphics for people to use, um, Facebook posts, in, you know, Twitter um, posts, it's all, it's great stuff. So we encourage people to really use this tool and we're doing it at the municipal level because that's where I deal with um, is we're hoping to get every municipality to have this up on their website. So if you don't contact me. Great, right, so. thank you, Sharon. Really appreciate it. So we have about uh, 12 minutes um, and before we're opening up to, uh, to um, questions and answers, uh, questions from the, from the audience. Uh, next question is for you, Lauren. Um, so the film brings up several social justice issues that arise, arise as a result of plastic production and waste from around the world, such, uh, such as concerns of public health, local property value, and piles of plastic being left in impoverished areas in the global south. Here in the US, because we often don't see the problems firsthand at that scale, it can be easy to forget about these issues. Can you comment on the plastic production and issues uh, of environmental justice in your work? Yeah, so I'm going to also share my screen. Um, so one, is this working? Can you see? Yes. Okay. Um, so one thing that we believe at the center is that we can't recycle our way out of this problem and we need to get at the source of plastic production, not only because of plastic is ending up in our oceans and in our bodies, but because the process of producing the plastic is so harmful for the communities near these facilities. So um, one campaign we have is against the proposed Formosa facility in St. James Parish, Louisiana, in Cancer Alley, so-called because there are already so many refineries in petrochemical facilities, fertilizer plant, a steel mill, because of a confluence of mostly um, very light environmental regulations, state subsidies, and easy access to Gulf, uh, Gulf fracked gas. So this facility would be $9.4 billion in a predominantly black and poor neighborhood. The community is rising up against this facility because it would double ethylene oxide emissions, which is a carcinogen in the area. It would emit formaldehyde, benzene, a um, whole host of carcinogens. And just a few months ago, the Office of Inspector General in, of EPA released a report saying, we only recently named ethylene oxide as a carcinogen but we also found that when we um, disseminated this information about the harms of this chemical, only white communities got the information. Communities of color in Texas and Louisiana were not informed of the risks. So um, we are suing for over the state permits, the federal permits. We're also suing because um, some grave sites of formerly enslaved folks were discovered at the site. Uh, and this is Sharon, one of the community leaders there who we're representing in the lawsuit. But they are planning a Juneteenth celebration at these grave sites. The plastics company wants to refuse them access. Um, saying, you know, we don't know who's buried there. And it's like, well, unfortunately, the way our history has played out, unmarked graves, are, like the, the graves of slaves were not marked. Um, so anyways, that's a digression. But yeah, we find that these facilities are cited mostly in poor communities of color and that they face much higher cancer risks. Um, other respiratory illnesses, like asthma, allergies, and those in turn make them more susceptible to diseases such as COVID. And I will 
stop sharing. Well, Laura, uh, um, for me and uh, everyone, I imagine uh, we appreciate what you're doing on those front lines. And, and considering what you just said, the next question is going to get, we're going to continue with you. Given the current crisis, is there a relationship between plastic production and COVID-19? You said it a little bit before, and then you just kind of touched on it just a moment ago, but that'd be great if you can say a little bit more. Yeah, so Harvard School of Public Health came out with a study recently that showed um, exposure to soot. Also, you know, it's regulated as particulate matter under 10 microns in diameter or under 2.5 microns in diameter. Uh, Long-term exposure to these pollutants increases the risk of COVID infection by 8%. But then if you layer on top of that, like disinvestment in these communities and many people with underlying health issues and comorbidity factors, um, we're finding in the US that black people are three times more likely than white people to get COVID. And a lot of that is because they're cited in these air highly polluted areas. Thank you, Lauren, appreciate that. Uh, we have about seven minutes, six minutes left. We have uh, two more questions. First one is for Erica and Dr. Weiss. Um, we see images of harbors and rivers choked with plastic uh, refuse in the movie. Uh, and um, we in the US consume an exorbitant amount of plastic. Why don't US shores like that look like the images in the movie? And why don't the plastics that contribute to the pollution come from predominantly only five countries in Southeast Asia. So um, that's for Erica and Dr. Weiss. I would like to refute the fact that our shores do not look like those in the movies by sharing my screen, which I will do <laughs> like so. Okay, so right here you're seeing, can you see this beach? Not yet. Not yet, okay, hold on. There's a special thing I have to do, this one. Focus, go. focus. Got it. <laughs> It's late. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is uh, Camilo Beach. It's a beach um, on the big island of Hawaii. I went there in 2016 after sailing from Los Angeles, California to Honolulu, and then I took um, additional transport uh, boat and car and got to this very remote beach, um, which only a few surfers knew about. So obviously, it's not like tourist trash showing up on this beach. Um, but I have to say, uh, you know, we learned in the film that um, we've pushed our culture of mass consumption into these countries that had been previously using natural materials, uh, such as banana leaves and paper um, to hold uh, products and foods. Um, but I have to also say that it's also just poor uh, ge geographic luck in some cases, because, for example, Hawaii um, is a very... Um, spiritually connected to nature kind of um, culture. And so many of the Hawaiians I met were like, we don't do this to our beaches, but uh, you know, sometimes tourists do, but this remote beach in particular on uh, the big island, it was just every day covered with more and more plastic. Um, you know, a, a cleanup group had come a few days before and look at this beach. Um, so it's kind of a crazy issue. I mean, we found, you know, this amount, I don't know if you can see this now, this amount of, um, uh, caps, bottle caps in just like a few minutes. So that was kind of um, an insane wake up call. So I have to say that, um, you know, water currents do play a role. And um, that's, you know, a major part of it as well. Um, so just because we're finding this plastic in Asia doesn't mean it actually comes from there. In fact, as we saw in um, the film as well, you know, there were plastic packages from Canada, from, you know, the US from all over the world. Right. So uh, that's, that's also part of it. Thank you, Erica. Appreciate it. And Erica, just a quick, quick glimpse of that. Um, yeah. I, uh, I noticed that uh, most of it was consumer debris. Is that, was that your take on it as well, or, or is it a That was my take, and I'd like to add that um, the scientists I sailed with, so I sailed with uh, a group of Danes, so I ended up in Denmark and marrying a Danish sailor. <laughs> but uh, long story short, uh, one of the scientists had told me that the split between uh, land-based plastic and fishing gear was actually 80 and 20%, so most of the plastic we're finding in the oceans um, and washing up on beaches is consumer-based single-use plastic that we have Thank on you, land. Erica. Appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Weiss. Just add a couple things. One is that uh, we have better waste management 
than a lot of those countries do. Uh, and uh, secondly, uh, we have organizations all over the country doing beach cleanups and collecting huge numbers of tons of stuff from the U.S. beaches. Uh, there's data from the Ocean Conservancy. I, I don't have a slide for it here. I, I do have a slide for uh, on, on the uh, numbers of you know bags and straws and styrofoam boxes and not and all of that stuff yeah. that gets picked up off of our beaches. Yeah. So uh, you know we got plenty. Yeah, we use uh, we use Ocean Conservancy in our uh, in our cleanups. Um, Sharon, we have a two minutes left. Yo, go ahead, Sharon. Yeah, that's you. I guess what I'd like to add to that um, is that, of course, as I said at the outset of um, the uh, webinar, is that we had been shipping, not just us, but um, all of Europe, Australia, New Zealand had been shipping their recyclables over to China. And so China would go and they would take out the good stuff and um, then it would then go to another market. There's a, there was a, a very damning uh, documentary that was produced in China under secret called Plastic China, um, that if you watch that um, it would break your heart, number one, but you know, a lot of maybe that waste from those countries that don't have the, the collection infrastructure that we do have for sure. But I think we should also look and say, it's not all their trash, right? It's, it's the trash that they were also sorting. So I think there's a, there's a global, we all share in that, I guess, is what I wanna say. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate um, the team, our panelists. Um, we are gonna move over to uh, questions from our audience. Um, let's say I've seen a whole bunch of them pop up. So uh, it's, it's awesome that they're, um, people are super engaged. So thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna try to get through as many of these as we can. Um, our team here has, has queued them up. So lots of interest in what individuals can do. Uh, we got so a lot of this has come up tonight, but um, some key parts about empowerment, empowerment and what we at Seaside like to offer, we hope to offer. Uh, we have a question from Jeff uh, Brownell who put it perfectly, uh, after watching the story of plastic, plastic, I am overwhelmed by the amount of plastic in my day-to-day -day life. What are the top three things we can do uh, as everyday consumers to make a positive impact? Lauren was kind enough to put some, some links to help answer this question. So please reference that everyone. Lauren, would you like to tell us a little more about what you shared? Um. It's not, I was in another panel with, with a woman named Cheryl Otter from Band Single Use Plastics, and she was talking about her own lifestyle adjustments she's made, and she referenced this Guardian piece, so I thought that might give some helpful tips, um, you know, using reusable stuff and just not buying things in the first place. Um, I think I should kick this over to Erica, because we focus more on stopping the plastic from being made. Uh, than consumer choices. So maybe someone else can speak to that. Yeah, I would like, I would totally like to add. Um, so when it comes to, you know, reducing our plastic use in our everyday life, I love to tell, I give a lot of lectures um, often to students. So I like to say, you know, look at that plastic water ball on your desk, often in a classroom setting. And, uh, you know, almost every student has a plastic water bottle. And I say, okay, if you spent $35 to get a really nice stainless steel bottle, and you could use it every day for the next 15, 20 years, you would save so much money. Um, so I think incentivizing like reusable materials, uh, reusable goods, bags, bottles, straws, you name it. Um, it you know, I even have, a, I should have brought it on camera, a reusable uh, ear swab which my friend got me. She's a plastic, anti-plastic person. Um, and you just simply wash it and let it dry. And it's just, you know, you don't have to use cotton ear swabs, which often have a plastic um, stem in them. So I think uh, looking towards reusables, because again, you know, before plastic, we just, you know, people told me in Italy, because um, I've traveled all over trying to get to collect these stories locally of, um, you know, why, how and why did plastic emerge as this uh, major pollutant? 
So a woman told me she used to go to the bread market every morning with a, an old tea towel from the kitchen and she would wrap the bread up and carry it home. And so we have to think uniquely. And I know that we are very used now to our fast paced lives. Um, but if Corona taught us anything, it's that we all really need to slow down. Um, and sailing taught me that as well. So I think that really kickstarted this, um, you know, ability now for me to think, okay, reusables are really easy to use. We just have to get in the mindset of slowing down enough to use them. Um, but yeah, but that you can find all products under the sun. Uh, I'm not a huge believer in replacement plastics, um, so-called bioplastics or um, yeah, biodegradable plastics, because often they are mixed with uh, chemical plasticizers that are not, that are still plastic based. So they're uh, not non-toxic. Double negative there. <laughs> it's getting kind of late. Um, anyway, yeah, so. Appreciate that. Uh, next question is from uh, E. Kashida, also known as Earl. Uh, can anyone expand on the microplastics in the seafood chain and its impact toxic, uh, toxicity concerns on human diets? Short answer is we don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, there are studies done at the cellular level. There are, you know, lots of the lab studies use very high concentrations that they feed microplastics to organisms. Um, and we can't do, I mean, it's just really hard to get your hands around what effect it's having on us. I mean, the fact is we're living longer now than we lived 50 years ago before plastics were around. And, and it's, you know, endocrine disruption perhaps, but it needs a whole lot more research before we can have any definitive answer, I think. Great, thank you, Dr. W Dr. Weiss. Uh, let's move to a set of related questions from uh, GCOF. I think some people actually put uh, ab abbreviation in their name. So. Um, Gkoff and Ben Wildrick, how do we address the issue uh, in the most upstream manner? Is it a legislative issue? How can we pressure our state and federal reps to pass legislation on making corporations responsible for packaging and subsidizing alternative packaging? Um, this is a long one, so if you can store it all up there. And how do we break the fossil fuel dominance of our political system? Any part of that you'd like to grab would be wonderful. Lauren, we're gonna start with you. Okay, um, I don't have all the answers about making our system not a fossil fuel, a petro dictatorship. Um, okay, but we are working on externalizing some of the costs of plastic production. So we have petitioned EPA to update its standards for water effluent, um, the little plastic girdles, which are the little resins from these facilities. There was a lawsuit in Texas from one Taiwanese company uh, that resulted in a settlement of $50 million because it kept spewing these plastic girdles into La Laca Bay. So we are urging EPA to update its standards for air emissions, water emissions. We also helped draft some legislation uh, the Break Free from Plastic Act, Pollution Act, which requires some of the measures we proposed EPA adopt, and also um, as a, it, it's a very big, expansive bill uh, that includes life cycle, uh, extended producer liability issues. So, you know, if you're looking, you're at a beach cleanup, and that all the Half the plastic bottles are from Coca-Cola, like they have to pay to clean that up and recycle it. So this bill is not probably not gonna pass, but at state and local levels, I think extended producer liability can is can go a long way in terms of reducing plastic because you know it's all about the how it cancels out. Like if pollution is just the cost of doing business, if they're not really paying for it and if by the same token, if they, these oil companies and gas companies can lease federal lands for pennies of what they're worth and if fossil fuel extraction is subsidized, like it's, it's not gonna be, um, the economic calculus is gonna be keep making plastic. 
So there are a lot of ways we can attack this problem. Thank you, Lauren. Sharon, yeah. Um, so I, I, I do want to say, I think, Lauren, you were talking about grassroots. And in Massachusetts, um, we have had uh, close to 140 bag bans that have been passed. Seaside Sustainability has been involved in, in several of those, as well as bans on uh, polystyrene. Uh, there, there is um, legislation uh, for paper and packaging. It's House Bill 745. Ben, I know you live in Massachusetts, so um, you could work on that. There's also one for mattresses, which is supported by industry. Um, been passed in Connecticut, Rhode Island, um, a paint care bill that's also supported by um, industry and every New England state except for New Hampshire and Massachusetts has passed, which is very frustrating. And um, a, a plastic bag bill that has gone through um, many iterations and for many years it still hasn't passed but where it's happening it's really truly happening at the grassroots level great i would like to add one quick thing if i can yeah. um so i the grassroots approach uh in support of that is that nobody knows your community better than you and so when you can come together with your neighbors and kind of educate each other um, gather local support write your local representatives get them involved and interested in the issue um, you can start really small. I've met some groups that started out just cleaning beaches and now they're changing laws um, in their community. So be encouraged. Great. And Thank look you. at the, if you're talking to your community, which is definitely the most effective way, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, I would just pop that, go, go look at it because we helped draft it and it has a lot of really good language in it. And adopt that wherever you can. Great. I, I hope uh, we can share some. Um, sh we can share some uh, resources to to the group that's been here tonight. So um, uh, have that opportunity to do that. Uh, next question is from Sarah Faye Mahone. Uh, can only a few households not sorting or cleaning recyclables contaminate the load from a community? And can this small amount of contamination cause recyclables to be diverted to the waste stream landfills? Uh, I guess that's that's a, a general question to you, Sharon. Yeah. So, um, you know, one household is not going to uh, cause an entire load to be rejected. Um, each of these processing facilities have different ways that they audit incoming loads. Everything is going to go, um, I, I, with few exceptions, everything is going to go through the processing facility. And at the end, um, they're going to dispose of the residual in, Ma in, in Massachusetts. That would mean most of it's going to go to a, a municipal waste combustor or an incinerator. Um, we still have some landfills, but it's mostly a, an incineration state. Um, we have definitely worked in the state, and I know throughout the country, we have really working hard on um, getting people to understand what is correct recycling. But in, in, I have a lot of large cities in my district and you have multifamily households and they might have 12 parts next to their building. There are six households and there are six trash barrels and, and six recycling. And you come down and you're not, you know, you're not looking, you're looking for capacity. You're not looking at is it going in the right bin? And we really need to focus on that. We're doing a lot of at the curb um, interventions, if you will, if you will, and trying to get it right. Um, so if if you have any questions, I'd ask your your recycling coordinator if you have one in your community, or go to your uh, Department of Environmental Protection and and see what what the rules are. Educate yourself. And um, and keep, yeah, uh, you want clean, empty, and rinse. It doesn't need to be perfectly clean, but empty, rinse it once. What does that mean? It doesn't have to be perfectly clean. That was going to be one of my my question too. Well, I, you know, I think everybody asks about peanut butter jars, right? So that's like like the toughest one. Um, it might be hard. So I, I think everybody kind of has their own system is I take a spatula and I put a piece of um, 
uh, paper towel around it and I swab it around as best I can, right? Because you don't want you don't want it to contaminate other things. You also don't want it to attract bees or rodents in these facilities, which food will, and that's another issue. And if you have a dog, it's a perfect cleaner. Oh, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> here's, one from, uh, here's one from John. Uh, will moving to electric cars reduce or increase, sorry, reduce or increase the petrochemical company's need to create plastics from their profits? Mm. Oh, because plastics are more lightweight and needed for efficient vehicles. Uh, I don't know. That's all that was written there. So yes, maybe. So could I just say, you know, I think the, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry, as they see people moving towards electro, electric vehicles, solar, uh, solar energy, I think we're, you know, we're saying this, it's hard to believe that there could be more of a proliferation, but this is where they're going to put their, their money into. So right now in Massachusetts, regrettably, during COVID-19, they have suspended the use of reusable bags at grocery stores, which is awful, right? So people are leaving the grocery store now with 20 bags, depending on what their shopping is. And, and they don't uh, even let you bring in your reusables, by the way. They well, what? They don't, well, the last time I was in the grocery store, they didn't let me bring in my reusables. No, right, exactly. It's, you can't use them. Uh, hopefully that's gonna change soon. But, um, you know, I think probably, again, the fossil fuel industry is going to like, there are some wonderful things that are made from plastic. I, I don't want to diminish that. But um, most of the packaging, most of everything we get is packaged in plastic. And it's, and it's not just plastic. It's, you know, it's multi-material. And with the, uh, you know, explosion of e-commerce, you know, the, the, um, the packaging designers have now you know, been focusing not on packaging for recyclables, for recycling, they're looking at integrating the packaging with the product to make it lighter and easier to ship. And um, it's hard, this is gonna be really hard, but we need to wean ourselves off of plastic in my opinion. Great, thank you. Plastic packaging, I guess I should qualify that. Lauren, was that, did you wanna comment? No, I was just giving snaps for sure. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, next question is from Dr. Artie uh, Kopel, Kopelman. Kopelman? Uh, the movie described bioplastics as a safe alternative. Are bioplastics safer? Do they fully decompose? Likewise, do bioplastics utilize uh, plasticizers? If so, are they green chemistry based plasticizers? And I guess I would like to have a follow up question too or a comment. There is a difference. I believe between bioplastics and compostable products. So uh, I know Erica kind of touched on that. So do you want to start? Sure. Um, so there are lots of different ways to make plastic that is not based out of petrochemicals. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these um, biodegradable plastics, we'll start with that one, um, they might actually be mixed with some synthetic uh, petroleum based plastic chemicals um, or man made processed chemicals. Um, but bioplastics are made from uh, different materials like cellulose or starch, um, sugars, et cetera. Um, so they basically are supposed to have the same kind of uh, properties as plastic, but they are not having that issue that they stick around for a long time. Um, and in the theme of kind of bio uh, engineering things, so we are now talking about using bacteria um, and other kind of natural fungi, et cetera, um, to make, to give um, these materials, these bioplastics, these uh, characteristics that we seek. So I think the answer is you have to know what you're buying. And often the petrochemical based plastic is much cheaper than the natural plastics. Great, thank you. Any, yeah, Sharon. I would just add um, when looking at items that say compostable, make sure that they are um, BPI certified, which is the Biodegradable Products Institute, ASTM 6400 standard. Nice job, Sharon. 
That's great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, as 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 a, as an organization that um, likes to ban things, we understand the replacements, even if they may uh, they meet uh, BPI standards and ASDM D sixty four hundred. You know, we know if you poke something here, something else gets affected. So uh, you know, Sharon, I think beats the beats the drum um, on uh, reusable, and you you all have is go reusable, reusable, reusable. So let's go from reusable. Um, so, uh, so a timely question here from, uh, uh, from Nick, uh, we're going to wrap up with this one before moving to final remarks. So, uh, Nick said, I'd love to hear more from the panelists on the impact on black and brown communities, both locally and globally. The documentary presented example in the global South and East Asia, as well as some Gulf states, but what kinds of impacts occur in our local communities? during the production of plastic? Good question, Nick. Well, uh, Lauren has talked a lot about Cancer Alley and I just went there in March uh, to report a story about the Formosa plastic factory. Um, so, and also when I've been in the Pacific, I visited indigenous communities um, who might have plastic factories nearby. Um, and uh, as Lauren said, there's a lot of health related issues. I mean, we're seeing people with uh, crazy skin problems. I've seen cancers. Uh, the trees were dying. That was a big uh, thing that people were pointing out to me when I went to this community. Um, so the air, water, and soil quality is diminished. There's an extreme amount of traffic coming in and out of these plants, which stretch, you know, as I said, over acres of, uh, of land. This is Formosa plant. Um, it's a $9 billion plant that is just starting construction in St. James Parish, um, it's enormous. And the people that live nearby really have no say over what is going on there. Um, a woman named uh, Diane Wilson, she was from Port, Port, Point Comfort, sorry, Point Comfort in Texas where Formosa had another factory and she uh, was the one who had this uh, successful $50 million lawsuit um, that Lauren also described claiming that um, the plant was violating uh, federal rules for pollution, which it was, um, you know, Diane came with these packets, thousands of packets of plastic uh, pellets and plastic powder that actually just escaped out of the factory. So imagine breathing all of that in, having that in your local waterway where people were, um, she made her career there, Diane Wilson, uh, shrimping in Lavaca Bay where this plastic had leached out in Texas. And she said to um, these people living now in St. James, listen, if Formosa comes to town, um, many people there are farmers and fishers as well you're gonna lose your livelihood. So it's a huge impact from health, livelihood, culture, community, um, you know, your quality of life with all the traffic and the pipelines and even uh, those working in the factory. So who might profit off of the factory being nearby? They're not being given the proper protective equipment. Um, so, you know, these health issues uh, persist. So I think that, um, you know, transparency is not uh, good. And of course these communities are being discriminated against. Um, it's very clear from what we're seeing. And I want to add a couple more impacts on top of that to Formosa. They are proposing to put this plant in a low-lying area. There's a low point in the levee, so it's going to make the community more prone to flooding. And they have also bought up, there's only, there's only Walmart now. There used to be like a local grocery store, as Eric was saying, like buying out these communities. Um, and the, the post office in the town shut down, the high school shut down and moved because the fossil fuel companies are buying up all the property and shoving people out. It's a horrible disinvestment in these communities. That's crazy. Well, thank you guys, appreciate that. So uh, we're coming to uh, the, uh, the end of our time together this evening. Before we wrap up, I'd like to invite our panelists to provide their closing thoughts on this one question that keep, keeps coming up throughout the evening. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it's a note that feels more appropriate to end. Um, and if you could try to do it in about a minute, that'd be great, 60 seconds. So what is one thing we can do personally to reduce plastic waste and pollution? Dr. Weiss. Well, I don't wanna put all the burden on individuals for their own personal, I mean, their own personal waste and, and choices they make. I don't think it's fair to do that. I think we have to work on 
the big oil companies that are making it and get stuff st stopped at the beginning rather than focusing on people cleaning up and not buying this or that. I mean, that will help a little bit, but we need to uh, really work on the manufacturing and, and get them, I think, the break free from plastic legislation, working on that kind of legislation or local legislation uh, is, has greater impact. Great, thank you, Dr. Weiss. Uh, sh uh, Sharon? Um, I would agree with Judith. I think we, we really need to pass um, extended producer responsibility laws nationally. Um, I think we have to have much greater emphasis on waste preve prevention and reuse. And, um, uh, and I think we, we really haven't touched on this, but uh, in Massachusetts, 26% of what we are throwing away is organics. And so I'd really like to see uh, an infrastructure for organics diversion. And also we need to keep that clean. You know, we've got to focus on getting it right. So thank you for this opportunity. I have learned a lot from everyone on this panel and even from the questions. Thank you. Me too. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Sharon. Um, Erica. Yes. Um, so my input is again yes supportive of the break free from plastics legislation um, any legislation that supports a circular economy which is the approach that we kind of um, you know use our waste over again and so there's this continuous circle of uh, resource use so instead of just discarding it when we're done using it um, but i think if we all change our mindsets uh, we could make a big impact too i mean sharing that um, with others i mean my sailing experience for example i just it changed me very much. Um, and now I don't dare touch plastic. <laughs> um, so yes, so thinking um, about our communities, our families, our friends, and just uh, taking responsibility as well. Great. Thank you, Erica. And Lauren? I support everything the other panelists have said so far. I would add that the executive branch has a huge amount of authority over the way our laws are implemented. And so if we have a Democrat, uh, not Trump in the White House or some, someone who cares about environmental issues, they could actually get a lot done only with executive authority. So that, that's important who are the agencies and the same structure is replicated on all the states who's the governor controlling the state of EPA and other departments. Um, and then also just being really open to new ideas and creativity, like with Black Lives Matter, abolish the police. A few months ago, that would have seemed like a really radical idea, but now there are op-eds about it in the New York Times. And I think we need to have the imagination to envision a world without fossil fuels. Thank you, Lauren. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, it's, you know, definitely a, an issue uh, with lots of um, impacts and uh, lots of ways uh, to, um, to tackle it. Um, and um, globally, we didn't even talk very much about just touch on circular, econo uh, uh, circular economy and producer responsibility, something we definitely have to tackle maybe in the next one. So, uh, Thank you, uh, warm, warm thank you all, all to our panelists. Thank you guys so much for being uh, part of this. And, uh, and of course, the story of plastic um, and the story of stuff. I don't know if you've actually seen the website, um, Annie Leonard, she's now actually the executive director now of um, Greenpeace. She started, I remember I used to show all my students the story of stuff and they have a whole bunch. So if you have a, have a minute, um, go on to story of plastic. There's a whole bunch of great ones. Um, and um, very, very pow powerful. Uh, also, so you're going to receive a survey the, this uh, at some point following the event. I'd love to hear what you thought of uh, tonight. Um, we're hoping to do more events like this in the future, definitely in this COVID future. Um, and, uh, the, uh, and also we want to tailor them to the formats and topics that interest you most. We'd really love your feedback. And uh, you can learn more about Seaside Sustainability by visiting our website, seasidesustainability.org. Please follow us on our social media, LinkedIn,
Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, CISA Sync. And uh, so we can stay connected with the topics we covered tonight. And, um, and if, of course, if you like what we do, please consider donating uh, to a uh, great cause to keep events like this happening. So be safe, uh, be well, and take care. And good night. And thank you, uh, presenters. Really appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, 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 Great. Bye-bye. Bye now.